Hello, my name is Nathan. I'm a developer advocate here at Komunda, and in this video I want to take a few minutes and talk about uh, something I've been thinking a lot about lately, and that is, can you use Komunda to migrate your architecture? Uh, now, we have a lot of content already about uh, utilizing Komunda to migrate away from legacy systems. Um, for instance, at uh, the most recent KamundaCon, which was in May of 2024 in Berlin, uh, First Americans spoke about how they're leveraging Komunda to modernize their internal applications and their business operations. It's a fantastic talk. I encourage you to go check it out at the KamundaCon.com website where you can access the recordings. Um, but I'm thinking about things closer to a development team, um, something a little bit uh, closer to what engineering teams deal with on a daily basis. Um, for instance, I'm thinking about, can we use Komunda to migrate from one cloud to another? Or is there a way to leverage Komunda to migrate your architecture from, say, a monolith to microservices? Um, for the rest of this video, I'm going to kind of use that example of monolith to microservices. It's a very popular example when we talk about architecture migrations, but I believe that most of these concepts could be used if you're migrating from one architecture to another, regardless of what those are. Um, and when you're doing that migration, there's always a set of challenges that comes with it. Um, you have business continuity. Of course, you need to make sure that the business continues functioning, that the application doesn't fall down as you're doing that migration. Um, for instance, in, in the case of a monolith to microservices, dependencies within the system uh, tend to be a little bit easier to manage within a monolith because they're all right there. They're all part of the main project. They're all deployed together. When you begin to decouple those services into atomic little units of work that can be deployed out separately and distributed, um, maintaining that continuity between the two becomes a little bit more challenging. Uh, there is domain complexity that comes with this as well. Uh, in order to do that sort of a migration, you have to have a very clear understanding of what each service does, what its responsibilities are, and what happens next in the application after that service is done. Uh, you need that knowledge in order to make all of the connections between those services, whether you're using service buses, um, event buses, message queues, like any of those patterns, you still have to understand how all of those dependencies are connected to each other in order to make sure that all the communication is happening appropriately. Uh, you also have data consistency. Uh, you want to make sure that all of your data goes where it needs to go and is written to the correct databases and is available when it needs to be available. Uh, that is a little bit simpler managing transactions within a single monolith than it is across a set of distributed services. Do they each have their own database? How are you going to keep that data in sync? It's all solvable but it's definitely a little bit more complex. And speaking of transactions, handling distributed transactions between those services uh, can be a little bit more difficult. Actually, it can often be a lot more difficult. Uh, within a monolith application, you know, everything, uh, forgive the oversimplification here, but everything's basically running in memory. And so it makes it very easy to roll back a single transaction that spans multiple services. It's all handled within the same application space. Uh, if you distribute each of those services into their own atomic decoupled units that are, you know, just de uh, deployed onto different platforms, perhaps different cloud providers, whatever it may be, um, now each one needs to understand what it needs to roll back, when it needs to roll it back, and you have to uh, manage that differently than you did in the previous architecture, and that can be challenging. Uh, there are quite a few guides out there uh, recommending uh, various steps you can take. Um, this is a guide from uh, Google Cloud um, that I thought was very fascinating. I recommend you go out and read it. But one thing that stood out to me was extracting services from the monolith. So let's do a little quick thought experiment here real quick. Imagine a loan origination process. Um, you have a, a user that submits a loan application to the bank. Um, that application needs to be validated, make sure that they provided their first name and their last name and their address and all of that proper information. Um, if they didn't, then we need to reject it. 
If they did, then it moves on to the next step of the loan application process. Uh, in my uh, basic example here, we're gonna retrieve the credit report. We need to get their credit score and do a background check so that we can do a risk assessment for this particular loan. Um, and then there's a, a, an, an additional set of steps that happen here. So let's imagine that this is a monolith application currently. We want to modernize it. We want to break each of these individual tasks out into their own microservice, its own atomic decoupled little unit that we can deploy and maintain on its own. So the first step logically would be, let's decouple the validate application step. What do we need to do to remove that from the monolith code base and make it its own? Well, at first glance, that's pretty simple. Validating an application, validating form, uh, form data is something that engineering teams do all the time. Very simple to build a service around that and then you know, return an error with a list of the errors within the application if needed, uh, or return you know, a flag that says, yes, this application is valid so we can move on to the next step. However, we can't just move that one service. We also have to make sure that this service can communicate with the email service and that this service can communicate with the retrieve credit report service call, wherever that may be. Um, so now we're making changes to not just the validate application part of the application, we're making changes to how we're retrieving the credit report, credit report and we're making changes to how we're sending email notifications. So there's a little bit more scope to the work than just saying, hey, we're going to create this one small little service to validate the application, deploy it, and we're done, and that's all we need to do. So um, now taking that, that same thought experiment, and let's say we've already implemented Kamunda. We already have this BPMN diagram, it's deployed, it's running in production. And now when a user submits a loan application form, this process kicks off within Kamunda. Now Kamunda is the one that's taking the result from the validate application task and either sending it to the email service or sending it to the retrieve credit report service and continuing to manage that throughout the process until the process is complete. The validate application step doesn't need to know where to send a message in order to pull a credit report or send a rejection notice. That's not handled by the validate application task anymore. That's handled by the process itself within Kamunda. And so now, if you think about it that way, now we're able to break this process out into sprints, perhaps. Uh, so now for sprint number one, the development team can take that validate application step, uh, turn it into its own microservice, deploy it out somewhere, and the only thing that changes within the process is where this particular task is pointing. In this example, we're using the REST connector, so maybe it's pointing to a different URL to make that call. Um, or perhaps it's a job worker, and you have the job worker deployed to a different uh, service out there in the cloud. As long as that job worker is starting and registering with the process engine, everything in this process is going to flow exactly the way it did before. But the difference is, of course, behind the scenes, this validate application step is now handled outside of your monolith. It's now handled in its own deployed service. Now maybe for sprint two, we're going to break out retrieve credit report and the email services. Now again, nothing changes within the process itself, just where these individual tasks are pointing. Same for the rest. And so it almost creates a roadmap of sorts for you to begin to break apart your application and migrate it bit by bit. Uh, or I've been talking a lot about the monolith to microservices approach, but maybe cloud to cloud, right? If you already have this all deployed into, say, functions within Azure, but now you're moving to AWS, uh, and each of these are going to become Lambda functions, well, now you're just calling the Lambda function instead of the Azure function, and nothing has changed within your application. Nothing has changed. Uh, I'm sorry, I apologize. Nothing has changed within your process. Your application is now deployed to a different cloud. The process still works end to end the same way it did before. So thinking back to some of those challenges that we face as we're doing a migration, uh, I mentioned business continuity. 
Well, the benefit here is that the process is already running end to end in Kamunda. Uh, Kamunda is already handling the little bits of data and logic that it needs to to move that process through to completion. Um, and is as each service is migrated away from the monolith or as each service is deployed to a new cloud provider, that process continues to function exactly as it did before. Uh, service decomposition. Uh, the BPMN diagram sort of acts as a roadmap. It's, it's right there to help you plan what steps you need to do to migrate from a monolith to microservices or from Azure to AWS or whatever that migration may be. That BPMN diagram becomes almost a literal roadmap for your teams. Domain complexity. Of course, one of the key benefits of BPMN is that it is a visual diagram that describes a process and it is living documentation. Uh, what you see on the screen in that BPMN process, when it is deployed to the process engine, that is exactly the process that is followed. There's no interpretation there. Uh, there's nothing to accidentally miss by a development team and cause a bug after everything goes to production. Uh, so by having everything already modeled in the process, everything already deployed, everybody all just automatically baseline level within the company everybody has a better understanding of that domain complexity there's a lot less questions and a lot less ambiguity around what's happening inside of the application data consistency well again similar to the business continuity Kamunda is already executing that process end to end you already have it defined as a bpmn model it's already deployed and it's already running so now as each of those services moves to wherever it's going to move to, um, nothing changes within your process. Again, just the endpoint that it's calling. Um, the, the process is still moving end to end. It's still moving the IDs from one point to another, and it makes handling that data consistency a little bit easier. Of course, inside of each of those services, you need to make sure that they're acting appropriately, that they're doing what they need to do with the data. Uh, if you're going with a very distributed approach where each microservice has its own database, you still have to do a little bit of synchronizing between those. But having that full end-to-end -end process already running just makes it a lot simpler. And distributed transactions. Uh, again, in a, in a monolithic application, um, it's very straightforward to cancel a transaction. Well. I'm sorry, it's not, it's not straightforward. Depending on the complexity of your application, of course, it, it can cause some challenges. Um, but it is it tends to be a lot simpler than it is in a distributed application with services all over the place. Um, but now with Kamunda and having a process already running, it's really easy to implement uh, distributed transactions with the Saga pattern and compensation events. These are natively supported BPMN elements. And when a compensation event is triggered, the process engine will go backwards through each of the steps that are marked and roll them back. So now you can decide how each of those uh, individual services is going to roll back that transaction. But the advantage is that each of those services no longer needs to keep track of where it's at in the process. Uh, so I rolled back this transaction. Do I now send that to service A or service B? Who's next in line? Uh, that's all handled by the process engine automatically. So you have full control over what rollback is occurring. And Kamunda is there to make sure that each of those rollback events happens. So this is something I've been, I've been thinking a lot about. And I see a lot of benefits of migrating an application to Kamunda before you begin some sort of larger architecture migration. Uh, but I'd be really curious to hear your thoughts. I'd love to see you uh, hop on the forum at forum.kamunda.io and share your thoughts there and continue the conversation. Um, but hopefully through this video, I've, I've uh, made you raise your eyebrow a little bit and, and think a little bit differently about how you might handle a migration. Thank you so much for watching.